There's a lot of discussion in the industry now about the importance of adaptive leadership, helping people to get change agility, helping people to learn to uh, deal with an ever uh, changing context. Sanders leading a track on his thought leadership on this topic this week. But real adaptation requires a tolerance of uncertainty, or what Sander will call productive disequilibrium. And to really tolerate being on the edge of the unknown, you have to cultivate a kind of inner stillness and a centeredness and a groundedness. So all the teaching about meditation and contemplation and chanting and all the practices that bring us home to that inner equanimity become ever more important. There's, of course, an enormous movement in the industry on addressing needs for a greater diversity and inclusion. And many of the programs that are trying to address that are doing it in a fairly tactical or technical way. But we would argue that in order to have real diversity and real inclusion, you have to have a very potent interest in other people's experience, how it's different than your own, and a receptivity, a cultivated, committed, steady receptivity to hear the pain of what it means to be marginalized or in an oppressed group. And finally, you can't have psychological safety and mental health in an organization or emotional well-being without being sensitive to and proactively addressing the trauma that we all carry. So these quests that we're on as organizations, as leaders, as a society, they call for deep inner work, which is why many of the tracks this week are not teaching tools or techniques. They're asking you to do this sort of inner exploration of your heart and your soul and to bring the best light that you are into the work. So another way to say this is that everything that's happening in our industry reflects a universal movement slowly and steadily from a society that's formed by fear to a society that's emboldened by love. So there really are two big secrets in corporate life. I'm going to tell you both of them. The first is the extremity and level of personal and collective trauma that everyone walks with and the level of regression that we see in organizations that are driving many of the pain points and the ceiling on the creativity and the quality of connection that we see in many teams. And the second is that spirituality, purpose, inspiration, the deep eternal flame inside each of us, however you describe spirituality, is the gold mine under the conference table. So this week is about helping people to heal and restore whatever personal and collective trauma you walk in the door with, and deeply about igniting that flame in each of us and in each other. I had the great privilege of going with my friend Marty Borison a few weeks ago to see uh, Aaron Sorkin's rendition of To Kill a Mockingbird in London, which is about the civil rights struggle in the United States. And uh, there were it's a very profound show, and you should go see it absolutely as soon as you can. Um, but two moments moved me, well, three moments moved me in particular that I thought I would share. There's a moment where the civil rights lawyer, who's a very just man, is uh, being asked by his daughter why some of the men in the community are in the Ku Klux Klan. And he says something that rippled through me like a lightning bolt. He says, when they lost the Civil War, they lost their dignity, and they're trying to get it back, which is the same thing they say about the Germans before World War II. And she says, but Daddy, that was 70 years ago. And he says, it was yesterday. It will always be yesterday. That's what collective trauma does. It's a permanent mark in the fabric of society until it gets repaired. The second moment is towards the end of the second act where his uh, African-American housekeeper and he, are, the civil rights lawyer, are standing on the porch and uh, there's just been a tragic killing of a man who was an African-American man who was sentenced to death for a crime he didn't commit. And the lawyer looks at her despondency and despair, and he says, uh, it can seem very dark at night, but there's always joy in the morning. And she says, the morning's taking a really long time to get here. 
So just feel the truth of that. And the many, many lives are touched by that truth. The last moment I would share with you is that they end the play singing a hymn. And in the beginning, only the sort of good guys in the play are singing the hymn. And then they drop the curtain and they pick it back up and everyone's singing the hymn. And I thought, that's what happens when we die. When the curtain lifts, when the veil lifts, we can see the goodness in everyone. So let's be that person now. Let's, let's end the splits of the polarity of the good and the bad and be that healing remedy now, everybody. <laughs>